cities are atrocious at just doing the bread and butter things that they're asked to do. Maintain this street, fix this sidewalk, keep the street trees planted on this stretch, pick up the trash, keep the crosswalks painted. Most cities today at their core are insolvent. When you step back and look at neighborhoods within a community, there are neighborhoods that are really financially productive, that have a really high return on investment, that are actually paying more in taxes than they require in long-term service. And for the most part, these neighborhoods tend to be the most neglected. What you have is the poorest neighborhoods in the community actually subsidizing the wealthiest neighborhoods in the community, while everybody kind of believes that it's the exact opposite. I think people who advocate for the disadvantaged and the impoverished at the local level have a real alignment here with libertarians, people who say people should be paying for the services that they want. So what happens is that there becomes a lot of outrage over privatization when really what the privatization tends to do is merely run the system the way that a competently run system should be. And the, the local governments generally don't have the incentive to make those hard decisions. Because I get asked this a lot. What two policies can we enact that would build strong towns? And my answer is always like, get out of the way. You know, stop, stop trying to fund from Washington, D.C., the local cul-de-sac. You know, like, just don't do it. And I guess that's kind of where I've fallen is that the more things can be localized in a sense, the more our, if we want to just say better angels or better instincts tend to govern those things as opposed to needing some like centralized force to enforce some you know fairness upon the situation. Urban renewal is a poster child for people who thought density was the answer. And it's, you know, just long line of failures. What we talk about at Strong Towns is, is not density, but a correlation between public investment and private investment. What we found is that wealth creation is really the proxy for success. You guys are supply demand people. When you have a hundred years of supply, what's the price? Zero, zero, but they were still charging a premium and building more lots. So by the time we got to 2008, I was just, I thought either I'm crazy or the world's crazy. I was open to either possibility. Welcome to An Architecture, episode 23. I had the opportunity recently to check out a talk by Chuck Marone, who was the president of Strong Towns at strongtowns.org. Strong Towns is a blog and podcast series that Joe and I have both been following for, for quite a while. Anybody who follows us on Twitter has probably seen a lot of their articles come through our Twitter feed. So I was really excited to meet Chuck at a, a local event here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is right near where I live. Strong Towns is not expressly a libertarian organization, but I think there are a lot of things in their message that resonate well with, with the kind of ideas that we've proposed and supported here on In Architecture. Yeah, when we first started this podcast, I put myself through a bit of a crash course on sort of urbanism and city planning and all this stuff because as a mechanical engineer, I hadn't had a lot of exposure to this stuff. I had been listening to James Howard Kunstler's podcast. He, he's a guy who talks a lot about this sort of uh, suburban decline and some of these sort of issues. And on one episode, he had been on a panel with a few other sort of urbanists. And one of them was Chuck Marone from Strong Towns. And he had mentioned on the panel that he had this blog and podcast that he did. So I started checking that out. And, and as soon as I started reading that, I, it all just clicked. And I said, oh, yeah, this is a sort of perspective that I can really get behind. So I dove headfirst into all the content that Strong Towns had to offer, and I've been following them ever since. Yeah, I think what's so compelling to us about Strong Towns' message is that they've really identified and quantified a lot of the kind of things that we talk about on, on the theoretical level. So this idea that things like sprawl and suburbanization have been essentially subsidized by government infrastructure are really, in a lot of ways, kind of an unnatural kind of phenomenon. We've said things like this, just kind of assuming at face value that, that they're true, because it, 
it, it seems to logically follow that when you're building lots of roads and pipes and wires out to distant places that don't have a lot of people paying for them, that you're going to get forms of development that are out of sync with what you'll hear Chuck describe as the traditional development pattern. What Strong Towns does is they actually quantify these things. So Chuck's background is in civil engineering. So he can actually put costs to how much that length of pipe costs or how much that mile of road will cost to maintain over a given number of years. And what we find is that our instincts that suggest that government subsidies in the form of infrastructure and development have not only created a development pattern that is undesirable in a lot of ways, kind of from an, an aesthetic standpoint, there are people who argue that suburban life is desirable, be that as it may, what Chuck and Strongtown show is that in most places, that type of development truly isn't sustainable, or at least it wouldn't be sustainable on its own merits if the government hadn't come in and built this stuff in the first place. Yeah, one of the key themes at Strong Towns is what Chuck calls the growth Ponzi scheme, which we discuss with him a bit here. This is a sort of kick the can strategy where local governments view growth as a key source of income. However, the, the physical structures that they're building aren't a good return on investment in the long term, especially once you factor in costs such as maintenance. And this is an issue that's pretty familiar to libertarians. Of course, we've got the Austrian business cycle theory, which is very similar to this, where we talk about these, these unsustainable developments that are built on a regime of artificially low interest rates that create all these structures and developments that are misaligned with the actual future demand and the future capability to keep them running. In fact, Murray Rothbard defines a capital good as a good that requires maintenance. And this is in contrast to land, which sort of acts as a capital good and that it has an ongoing service that it provides. However, land doesn't actually require maintenance. And consumer goods don't require maintenance because they get used up in the process. But capital goods are unique in that they do require maintenance. And of course, when we think about the infrastructure we have in our cities, you know, the, the water systems, the sewer systems, the roads, these are all capital goods in that sense, in that almost the defining characteristic they have is that they do require maintenance. And it's interesting to see, I mean, Chuck has been to hundreds of cities around the U.S. meeting with local mayors and councils and trying to help them to see where they have problems with some of these unsustainable developments. And it's interesting to get his take on the lack of maintenance in a lot of these places. Now, we could, as, as libertarians, it's easy for us to sort of jump on that and, you know, and say, oh, look, at, look, see, these governments aren't providing the things they're supposed to be providing, you know, just, just bash on the governments for doing this. But if, as Chuck explains, there really is more of a deeper-seated problem here in that there's been these investments made in the past where people just haven't considered these ongoing maintenance costs. Yeah, they're essentially treating capital goods as consumer goods, right? Yeah. They're treating streets and infrastructure as, as a, a one-time purchase that's essentially disposable without building in a commitment to long-term maintenance of those capital goods. You know, the reason that we wanted to start a libertarian podcast focused on the built environment is that part of our hope was that we would be able to describe libertarian principles and theories with some concrete examples. We could show the actual physical effects of governmental policies as they are expressed in the built environment. And I think that the work of Strong Towns really puts a lot of meat on those bones for us. Yeah, they've definitely done a lot of work for us. Yeah, I mean, again, and they're not expressly libertarian. You'll hear Chuck say that he has some libertarian instincts. But as he says, they have supporters from all sides of the political spectrum. And I think for us, that's something that's hopeful, that if we can find a libertarian message in the, the kind of truth that Strong Towns is putting out there, that hopefully these conversations about the built environment and the way it's been developed and things that governments have done wrong or done poorly in the course of that development, hopefully those kind of discussions can open a door for people who might not otherwise be interested in the libertarian message or might not understand it to start to relate to the idea that government solutions are often problematic solutions that don't allocate costs fairly and that have many unintended consequences. I think there are some differences between the Strong Towns approach and the an architecture approach. But as you'll see in this discussion, even in those differences, I think there's a lot of sympathies between the two approaches, where it probably comes down more to matters of, of implementation and you know what's appropriate for towns as they stand right now versus some sort of ideal of what towns could be in the future. There's one term that I use sort of towards the end of the podcast, which is strode. 
This is a term that Chuck has come up with for something which is not quite a street and not quite a road. And the way he defines these is that a street is really something that you would see in a small downtown area where it's walkable, it's accessible. It's not just about getting cars from point A to point B, whereas a road is something that is really more just about getting from one place to another where, where you don't expect to have a lot of businesses and cars turning in and out of this road. It's, it's really more of just a, a link from one place to another. But of course, what we have in a lot of places is the dreaded strode. What a strode is, is what's very common, which is where you have cars that can travel at a high speed, but then you've got a lot of maybe strip malls or condo developments, a lot of kind of turn-ons and turn-offs from that road. The way it's designed is that stuff is spaced out so much that you can't really walk there. And of course, it's dangerous to walk there because the cars are going so fast. But at the same time, since you've got all these cars constantly turning on and off, you've got stoplights everywhere, and so it's not an efficient way to get cars from one place to another. And Strong Towns has identified this as really one of the key signifiers of a poorly thought out development, and one of these developments that has really departed from what Chuck calls the traditional development pattern. A lot of people might call this sprawl, although Chuck has had some things to say about sprawl as well, where He's not quite as anti-sprawl, per se, as, as other people are. He's got a few blog posts on the site that we can link to to sort of show you where he's coming from there. But I just love this term, strode, because it, it sounds like some sort of foot fungus or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, I mean, it, yeah, it, is, it sounds kind of funny, but there is a, a, a kind of a dark underbelly to it, which is that when you have these roads, that they become very dangerous environments for pedestrians or bikers. And that's another thing that's really important about the Strong Towns message is it's not just about the financial picture. It's really about creating functional, livable, safe spaces, in addition to making sure that they're productive and sustainable and resilient. So we hope you'll enjoy our interview with Chuck Marone, founder and president of Strong Towns. And we strongly recommend checking out their content, both on their blog, in their podcasts, the Strong Towns podcast, Upzone, and It's the Little Things as well as Chuck's upcoming book, which is called Strong Towns, A Bottom-Up Revolution to Rebuild American Prosperity. So Chuck, uh, thank you for joining us on An Architecture Podcast. We've been following you f uh, and your work at Strong Towns uh, for quite a while, and we're really excited to talk to you. I think that there's, there's a lot of, of stuff we see in your work that's sympathetic to the kind of things that we promote uh, here on our podcast. Thank you. That's very kind. I appreciate uh, the opportunity and I love to talk about this stuff. So let's do it. <laughs> Great. So why don't you start by, for anybody who isn't familiar with Strong Towns, can you talk about, first of all, just generally, what is a strong town? How do you define that? Um, are there ways that you measure and quantify that? What does it mean to have a strong town? I think at the very base understanding, a strong town is a place that can take care of itself. Basically, are you a town that, are you a place, a city, a neighborhood, a block, uh, a community? Can you maintain your own basic infrastructure? Can you pay your own police department? Can you have a fire department that you don't have to lay off everybody and pretend you have service, but actually don't? Can you pay your pensions? Can you meet the basic obligations of your community? If the answer to that is yes, then you're a strong town. You're on your way to becoming a strong town. For pretty much every city in North America, uh, with you know very few exceptions and, and ones that I've not run into, I couldn't point to them, uh, the answer is going to be no. <laughs> Most <laughs> cities today have, have uh, essentially at their core are insolvent. And so our movement, our conversation is really to shine a light on why that is, uh, why cities are struggling financially. And what we need to do differently to put us on a, a different path so that we do become financially strong and resilient so that we are we can take care of ourselves and, and essentially have a base of prosperity that can emerge within our communities. Yeah. So thinking about all these towns that are that are not strong towns out there, what is it um, maybe in a little more specific that makes them weak or I know you use the word fragile and anti-fragile a lot. Yeah. What is it that makes these towns fragile and, and how have we gotten to this point? One of the things that I started to do early on in Strong Towns, I, I, this started as a blog. So it was basically me writing 
about cities that I had experienced and projects that I had worked on as an engineer, as a, as a planner, I started putting math behind the projects that we had done. Here's the revenue that comes in from this project. Here's the expenses and the obligations. What we see is that largely in the post-World War II development pattern, which you can just think of as this horizontal expansion of cities, there's a big vertical element too in large cities where you you know have this, this skyscraper phenomena. But largely, this has been a horizontal phenomena. When you look at that, look at it as an engineer would, you're building for every house 20 times the amount of pipe, 20 times the amount of road, sidewalk, curb, stormwater drainage area. All those things are immensely expensive. They're, they're ridiculously expensive. What we have done is we become really, really good at wrapping those costs up during the first life cycle, the first time it's built in home mortgages, commercial loans, construction loans, uh, municipal debt, federal government grants, state incentives, all these programs to essentially build new stuff are there to help us with this horizontal expansion. If you're the city government, this is all great. It's like you pay five cents on a dollar and you get all this growth. You know, you might have a little bit of local match, a little bit of skin in the game, but really most of the costs are somebody else's. And you get now all the permitting fees, you get all the transaction fees, you get more sales tax, you're gonna get more property tax, you're gonna have more residents. If you have an income tax, you're gonna get that. And so you look at it in a very short term, it's like a sugar rush from a cash flow standpoint for a city. New growth is fantastic. It solves all kinds of, of financial problems for you. What you take on in exchange for this great rush of cash is you take on the long-term responsibility to provide service and maintenance. So you're saying, in a sense, 25, 30 years from now, when that road falls apart, we as a community are going to go and fix it. We, the taxpayers of this place, will repair that pipe and replace that hydrant and maintain that sidewalk and provide the police protection and the fire protection and the parks and all this stuff that the costs are not upon us today, but they'll be a generation from now. And what we see is a lot like slash and burn kind of agriculture. This has a profile where it works out really, really well in the short term. And then when those expenses start to come due, everything falls apart. Everything goes bad in multiple dimensions. Cities tend to respond to this by taking on more debt. We've made it very, very easy for cities to take on large levels of municipal debt. Cities also will become very desperate for growth. So you see an emergence over the last two, three decades, uh, more and more the tax subsidies and the chasing growth and what can we do to get those new big box stores or housing subdivisions or whatever it is. All this is because the growth we're so desperate for because it solves our or it solves our immediate cash flow issue. It helps us with that. But it's this trade-off of, of long-term liabilities. We call it a Ponzi scheme. You can think of it as, you know, you got to keep accelerating your rate of growth in order to keep up with all the promises you've made. And ultimately, like any kind of pyramid scheme like this, the math just breaks down. You can't get the degree of growth you need. You can't borrow enough money. You can't hawk enough things to make it all work. And so the place starts to fall apart. And when we look at, you know, first ring, second ring suburbs, these places that, you know, were the kind of the first rendition of this new experimental kind of growth we were going to experience, those places largely really struggle today. And we're starting to see that kind of seep out further and further now over time. It's basically a pattern of building that exchanges your stability for growth. Traditional development patterns were really, really stable and productive, but they didn't grow real fast. Now we have a development pattern that grows really quickly, but the trade-off is we lose our stability. We become, as you said earlier, fragile. So this sounds a lot to me. Um, we're big fans of the Austrian School of Economics. And I think I've read some of your writing where you said that you're, you're pretty sympathetic to them as well. Yeah. This sounds a lot to me like the Austrian business cycle theory, um, <laughs> where, where it is, uh, it's all about sort of um, artificially supplying debt early on in the process, and you get this big boom, and then there's sort of real-world factors that, that pile up that eventually just make the whole thing unsustainable. Um, and, and to me, this, this sounds a lot like, like the, the growth Ponzi scheme that you talk about. I think this is the classic struggle, right? Is, do you focus on the boom, or do you focus on the bust? And I think a lot of times planners and engineers, you know, my colleagues, 
we tend to focus on the bust part of it, right? Because we're the technocrats. We're the ones with the solution. A problem is a great opportunity for us to come in and show what we can do. I think what we've tried to do at Strong Towns, and I, I think this is an important kind of application of this Austrian school thinking in many ways, is to say, look, you know, we're creating this problem with these artificial booms. We are, in a sense, inflating these markets. And you know, we're doing it because the growth helps solve an immediate problem, but you've got this long-term hangover that comes with it. And it's, it's more costly than th the thing you're trying to solve in the first place. And we've, we've gotten ourselves, you know, kind of like the macro economy at large, we've gotten ourselves into this trap where we don't have a lot, of, you know, we don't have any options that aren't painful at this point to kind of unwind this situation. And, and that becomes kind of a double tragedy, right? Because the forces that focus on the bust are very, very happy to create an even bigger boom, you know, to avoid that. And of course, you know, we kind of understand that that's only pushing things off into the future and making things a lot harder. What sort of solutions do you guys propose for some of these towns that are struggling or, or that are maybe sort of on the cusp of failure, but not quite there yet, you know, that, that have a bit of a chance of, of recovery? I'm going to answer that in a way that is probably displeasing. And then you can ask me a follow-up <laughs> question if you want me to delve deeper. Yeah. But, you know, we have categorically kind of rejected the idea of a solution. I, I think a solution is part of the problem. The idea that you take this complex adaptive system known as a city and you treat it like it's a mechanical device where, oh, we got this pain over here. So let's do this solution. Like here's the band-aid for this. What we really try to get cities to think of is to go beyond a simple cause effect, you know, like here's the problem, here's the solution, and really understand that if we're going to have long-term prosperity, long-term success, it's going to have to emerge through feedback. And, and feedback is sometimes pleasurable, but more often than not, it's very painful. It's the feedback that you get This is like, this is not working. Oftentimes when we talk to public officials or we talk to activists or people within a community who are struggling, they want to talk about solutions as in how do we maintain and take care of and solve all these problems we have today without any pain. And oftentimes those kind of things are apply for a federal grant or go get a loan or you know do something to basically put off the consequences of your past actions. What we talk about is we actually have to respond rationally now. We have to actually put systems in place where we create good ground up feedback loops in our neighborhoods and our blocks so that individuals can make good decisions and those decisions can kind of reinforce each other. And we can start to see in this big mess that we've created of a city, what neighborhoods are really viable and going to emerge as prosperous places and which ones do we have to have some more difficult conversations about what comes next. I'm sorry. I have a lot of thoughts now. After, after yeah, no, go down. ahead. Well, first of all, just an observation, the way you just described that, that there's no solution, that there's not like a silver bullet here that a government can come in or maybe anyone else can come in and, and do to, to fix these things. That reminds me a lot of, as Joe said, kind of the Austrian approach to correcting the economic bust um, that comes in the boom and bust cycle where, you know, the Austrian um, free market minded economists are often blamed as being kind of cold hearted because they want people right. to take their medicine when they're when they're, you know, when they're hurting the most. <laughs> but the, at the same time, of course, the Austrian message is, look, it's just, we need to be consistent about our relationship to things like debt and to the interest rate and to things like money creation, which is, of course, that's all related. The question I had is when we're talking about cities I guess becoming weak in the first place and then eventually as joe said you know finding ways to become stronger who is doing that is obviously government has a role there but i i suspect it's not just government what are the roles between governments residents developers and maybe even the engineer and design community in making these places weak in the first place and possibly being part of the, the <laughs> whatever solutions may be out there right I think this is where is some of my libertarian tendencies have tended to conflict with some of my communal instincts at the very local level. So let's back way up. 
and look at federal and state policy. Cause I get asked this a lot. I mean, I've been invited to the white house. I've been invited uh, to testify at a lot of state legislatures. What two policies can we enact that would build strong towns? And my answer is always like, get out of the way, you know, stop, <laughs> stop trying to fund from Washington DC, the local cul-de-sac, you know, like just don't do it and stop coming in and, and trying to, you know, engineer the next level of the perfect city from the state capital. Like, don't do it. Just allow these places to adapt on their own. And if you're going to do something, and I think, you know, we can look right now at the debate they're having in California over SB 50, uh, which many like Yimby and libertarians have, have latched on to is like a great, this is a great bill because it forces cities to stop being kind of parochial in not allowing development in kind of key areas. I tend to take a little bit different view. I think it, it is very prescriptive in that it forces a certain level of kind of corporate expa- you know, hyper expansion on a few areas where the government granted has gone in and screwed up the market by making these billion dollar transit investments without any kind of corresponding feedback loop in the private sector. I'm not sure as that's how you fix it. So I kind of tend to be very libertarian at that level. When we get down to the local level, though, now I think it becomes a very different conversation. And I, my, my like barn raising tendencies tend to come out. And you could call this like an anarchist side if you want to make it more libertarian, or you could yep, call that's- it, <laughs> yeah, or or you could, but but I think honestly, you could call it a more communal side too. Like you know, you look at communities of people all over North America and really all throughout history have come together at the local level to raise barns and put up city halls together and, and, you know, communally figure out how to do things. I think we're pretty darn good at that. And so when I think like, what's the role for the city? I I think cities have a couple of very important roles. I think the first one is cities have to become, and they're not today. They need to become really competent at doing basic maintenance. Cities are atrocious at just doing the bread and butter things that they're asked to do. Maintain this street, fix this sidewalk, keep the street trees planted on this, you know, this stretch, pick up the trash, keep the crosswalks painted. When you step back and look at neighborhoods within a community, there are neighborhoods that are really financially productive, that have a really high return on investment, that are actually paying more in taxes than they require in long-term service. And for the most part, these neighborhoods tend to be the most neglected. They're the oldest. They're kind of the pre-depression era neighborhoods. And if you go to, not, not the big booming cities in this country where you've had a lot of shift in development patterns, but if you go like throughout the Midwest, throughout the South, what you see is a lot of these struggling neighborhoods tend to be actually really financially productive. From the city standpoint, they're really profitable neighborhoods. If the city could just get competent in maintaining these places, they'd see immense return on investment as a community and really create a lot of capital for themselves to be able to do some really productive things. I think the other thing that cities have to do is they have to orient themselves or reorient themselves, let's say, away from looking up the government food chain for direction. So what's the state program we can get a grant for? What's the federal program we can get an incentive for? What's the big developer that comes to town? What do they want to do? And instead start to look in a sense at their neighborhoods, at their communities, at the people who are living there and take their cues for what a good project is from the experiences of the humans who live in their place. When you do that, what you find is that the big investments are not build the new stadium uh, or, you know, get the new big box store or run the two miles of pipe out on the edge of town to get new development. The great investments, the ones that actually, when you spend a dollar, you get back $5, $10 or more as a government and a local level, those investments tend to look like planting street trees, putting in crosswalks, making it easier to walk from this neighborhood to the park. Those kind of investments have a huge payoff. There's no way to get them funded from the state and federal government, there's not a lot of people clamoring for them because they don't have a great constituency. But in terms of actual investments that not only improve people's lives, but have huge payoffs, uh, those kind of investments are, are massive. I think if 
city governments could do those two things, focus on maintenance and focus on the small attention to detail, small investments that would improve the quality of life for people. I think that you'd see a huge turnaround in a very short period of time. We come at this from this this sort of anarchistic point of view, right? Well, we're, we, we'd like yeah. to ask the questions, okay, what if there was no city government? And I even wonder, when you, when you talk about all these things, whether the sort of structure of, of a city government has sort of an inherent bias towards facilitating the, these bigger kind of capital projects rather than the sort of local maintenance stuff. And, and if there's maybe a scale issue or, or, or a level of focus issue there that is sort of inherent in the very concept of a city government as opposed to maybe local neighborhood groups or, I don't know, e- even private owners of different services such as, you know, roads or, or water supplies or, or sewers or something like that. Curious to see what your thoughts are if we sort of take it out to that extreme. I think you're right. I think you're inherently right. And I think, you know, this is where kind of the theoretical meets the real. And I'm sympathetic in many ways to the argument that, you know, boy, when you look at a local government and you look at a bureaucracy, the incentives there are all messed up. I mean, in my little town here, I live in a city of 14,000 in the middle of Minnesota, a couple hours north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. We've got a new city administrator. She's wonderful. She's very smart. I like her a lot. I think her heart's in the right place. Uh, She's here not six months, and the new proposal is to tear down the 1930s beautiful city hall building and build a new city campus in the middle of the community because it would be more efficient. You could cut down from having four secretaries and different buildings to only having two in one. And, uh, you know, this would solve all these problems, and we'd only have to take on $25 million in debt, but we could do it. And, you know, it's like, No, these are simple. These are, we can solve these problems in much simpler ways. I think when you institutionalize something, it tends to want to maintain that kind of institutional center of focus and do less serving of people and more serving of itself. Here's where I kind of go the other way, though. I, I had a debate once with Randall O'Toole, who, you know, bills himself as a libertarian. And I don't know how you guys feel about him. I think some of his writing is interesting. I've tended to, disagree with a lot of his thoughts, especially when it comes to local cities. We got a conversation in this debate over his own street, the street he lives on. And he made a point. He said, well, you know, I have a paved road and when the road falls apart, my neighbors and I all get together and, uh, and, you know, chip in and pay for it. And like, you know, okay, great. That makes a lot of sense. But then he went on and he described, he said, you know, we had one neighbor who uh, didn't want to, didn't like the idea, didn't think they should have to pay. And uh, we had to bring this person to court and we had to go through this legal process and, and uh, you know, uh, force them to pay their share. And it was, and I, he started going and describing this. And I, I recognized that at the very local level, one of the difficult things about libertarianism is that you have the transaction cost problem. We can, as a, if you think of like the, a Puritan community in the, in the Northeast in the 1600s, the transaction costs there were involved social pressure, right? Like if you wanted to be part of this community, here are the social expectations you have. And so you didn't have to have a lot of government because you kind of had this like community bonding thing where, you know, if you don't do this, uh, you know, we might label you a witch and throw you in the water and drown you, you know? So, Hey, get on board. It's coercive, but it doesn't involve government. If you go to like Randall O'Toole's world, Yeah, you know, you can all get together and maintain your road. And if you all agree, it's great. But if someone doesn't, now you've got a, you know, $6,000, $8,000 court case you got to bring to force your neighbor. I mean, the person who lives next to you, who like literally you're going to hopefully have over for 4th of July picnic and hang out with, you got to take this guy to court and have a court case with him. I mean, that just seems ridiculous. And so to me, from a practical standpoint, I've kind of accepted a level of, local government as a necessity, as like a collection of us, the way that we together do things. I think that local government works best when it is focused at the people, not up the government food chain. And I think that's where we have kind of post-World War II run into all the problems. The, The local government now has not become like the thing closest to the people. It's become the tool of implementation of federal and state policy. 
And I think that has really distorted what local government should be, uh, which is really like at the end of the day, the way we get over some of these, you know, transaction costs in a sense of uh, what in a non-local government world would be really messy. Yeah, I, I uh, have two things I want to respond to there. Yeah. Um, one is this this idea that government is essentially the the vehicle or the entity that that community becomes expressed in, you know, in a, a given town or city. I think that's true. I, and I think that I had given a talk that was in one of our previous podcast episodes. And one of the points I made there was that essentially government has become all the things that that community was in maybe those Puritan days or, or whenever that nowadays government has kind of become, it has kind of taken on that mantle that when people now think about government or that when people think about community, they're thinking about the government within that community. Right. And so, for, you know, for us as libertarians, if we come out and, and propose something that, you know, that the government shouldn't be doing something, people take it as an affront against the community, even though right. we might be proposing something different. So what, so we have, tried to propose some other ways beyond just the, the Randall O'Toole kind of, you know, we're all going to essentially form de facto homeowners associations, you know, and no one erodes that way. We tried to come up with some other ways and we won't get it. I don't have to get into all of it here of different ways that that could possibly ma be managed and, and monetized and, and all of that. The other thing I want to say is that this idea of speaking to Joe's question, taking government away, you know, if, if the city government were to go away tomorrow, like could any of this stuff function? And there's this, this purity test among libertarians, which is, you know, the red button. If you had a red button, you could push um, and end government tomorrow. Would you push it? And, you know, I probably had times in my life when I, I would have said yes, <laughs> but I think, especially since we've started talking about some of these issues more on our podcast, um, I've, I've backed off from that. And it's essentially the reason is that I think in order to have success on the libertarian front, we need to have what you guys would call small bets that maybe we're not taking the entire street network away from government in one fell swoop. But maybe there is a neighborhood where there's some logic there to that becoming owned separately from a government, maybe especially in, in a failing city where there may be some some outlying infrastructure that the government just says, you know what, we can't sustainably maintain this anymore. That starts to open up opportunities for community groups to form maybe some kinds of, of trusts, a public trust or, or something, or maybe some kind of business to come in and, and take on that piece of infrastructure as something that, that they can try to make solvent again. Let me give you a, a thought and see how you guys react to this. Because this is one of the things we struggled with a, a little bit here early on and I think have kind of resolved internally because strong towns is if we look at American politics today, strong towns is a really mixed bag of political affiliations. We have people who I think would identify as hardcore socialists who love our stuff. And we have people who are hardcore libertarians who think like we're the greatest thing around and we've got like everything in between. And part of what we have, I think, done in our conversation is said, you know, if we look at a place like Portland, Oregon, or Seattle, Washington, uh, we understand that a local government in that context is going to be very, very different than if we're looking at something in like rural Texas or New Hampshire or South Carolina. These are going to be very different local governments with very different kind of approaches to things. And our kind of reaction has been you know what? We're not necessarily saying that there's one perfect path to building a strong town. If your path is we're going to have a high tax, high uh, response local government, and we're going to have a lot of like neighborhood associations and community groups, and we're going to have this really kind of thick bureaucracy, and that's the way we want to run Portland, Oregon. There's a part of me, and I this might be the you know actually like the libertarian part of me who says, you know what? If you all are good with that and like if you vote and that's what you want to vote for, you're not forcing me to move there. I, people can move and leave and what have you. If you got a small town in, in New Hampshire somewhere and you say we want to be like the libertarian utopia, the streets are going to be privately owned and you know we're going to manage them that way and they're all going to be – I really don't care either. At the end of the day, you just have to be able to afford to maintain your stuff. And if you don't have good feedback loops internally, that's not going to work. For us, it's kind of been an, an embrace of, 
I don't want to say localism because I think the localism gets mixed up with like the environmental movement, but essentially like a governmental localism, a step above the anarchy in a sense, where we think from a subsidiarity standpoint that good decisions can be made that respect the will of the community, recognizing that communities are going to be different in different geographies and different locations. Does that, how does that square with the way you guys would approach things? I think it squares pretty well with it. I, get, I think what we would say, first of all, living in a, in a small town now, I'm actually just over the border from New Hampshire and Maine, but being in a small town, and just last night I was at a, at a, a public hearing for a new library that we're looking at doing in the town. And, um, you know, seeing all the, I mean, there are a hundred people in this room and, this is, and seeing that kind of participation, you know, all those things we talk about, about community participation and the government acting as a community, those things do happen in small towns. And so, yeah, so I think to your point that it's kind of the best, the best we have at this point in some places. And again, I'm okay with that. You know, I'm, I'm not pushing the button. The problem I see is when we can't bring other opportunity or other possibilities to the table, that it's just assumed that if there's going to be a road somewhere that the government's going to maintain it. You see this a lot like a development will get built and then 10 years later, the city takes over ownership and maintenance of the road, which I, I don't understand why cities do that, <laughs> but they do. I, I mean, what's, I don't understand what's in it for them. I could give you some thoughts, but none of them are rational, right? Yeah. None of them involve like putting pen to paper and going, is this a smart thing for the overall community? Yeah. Right. Well, other than, other than, I mean, here's, so here's what I see as the rationale is that, well, these people in this development with what's now a private road, essentially, these people in this development are paying the same tax rates as these people over here who are served by public roads. So shouldn't they all be getting the same benefits out of this, out of this mix? And, and, you know, you get into similar arguments with like school systems and, and all these things that that governments do. Let me um, let me give you the libertarian response to that though. Because to yeah. me, like that's a that's an easy libertarian response because you say, well, the price of your home factored in the idea that this wasn't a local road. You know, like you you should have mm -hmm. paid less for your house because you were going to pay more for road maintenance. And right. ergo, you know, if you want now this subsidy from the public, uh, there should be some transfer of wealth to make up the difference. And the reality is, is it probably is a really bad investment for the city for the, you know, for the community at large. So I, I would, if I were an engineer, I would not recommend they do that. The engineers always do because they like to get paid to maintain roads. And, uh, you know, <laughs> but I, it, you know, from a dollars and cents standpoint, I think the libertarian argument there's pretty clear, right? Yeah. So Joe, do you want to jump in? I want to ask another question if kind of follow up. On yeah. That. Well, I'm, I, I guess again, more of a, maybe just a comment. You know, I, I think the libertarian approach, which I think aligns pretty well with the strong towns approach, at least in theory is that really the way to to sustain these places is for the the users to be charged a fee in line with what they're actually using and in line with the actual costs that they're incurring so so this development out on the edge of the town you know naturally like you said should be paying more for maintenance than the more high density development closer to the center of town I agree with that. Yeah, we don't do that, but that's that would absolutely be true. Yes. Yeah, and, and and you know, and of course, the big challenge is well, how do you actually facilitate and manage that sort of you know that sort of financial system, um, that that sort of billing system? How do you do that without you know pissing off all the people that live out <laughs> a bit further out that don't quite understand why you know why their services cost more than someone else's do? We did a study in in Lafayette, Louisiana, and. Uh, in Lafayette, everybody pays the same sewer bill, every, every home, like every single family residential home. We found like one neighborhood where the sewage ran from the home in, you know, in a pipe by gravity down to a lift station where it was pumped to the treatment plant. A uh, very simple system. Uh, we found another neighborhood where the sewage ran out from a pipe in the house, was pumped 23 times before it got <laughs> to the same treatment plant. <laughs> They pay the same bill. Yeah. Okay. That doesn't make any sense at all, you know? <laughs> but if, you know, if you're running the system and your incentives are to grow, you know, because you get a hookup fee and you get, uh, you, know, a new, a, you know, a little bit of new monthly revenue and the cost to maintain that pipe is pushed out 30 years, 40 years, this makes a lot of sense for you as a bureaucrat. As a community, it doesn't make any sense. 
right? It doesn't make any sense. But how do you now go back and tell that person, well, we're going to increase your sewer bill <laughs> by 10 times. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the conundrum we have. That's, yeah. you know, a big yeah. part of the problem. Yeah. I, I've seen, um, I think it was Baltimore recently. They passed a, some sort of legislation banning privatization of their water supply. Mm. And, you know, and at the same time, they're all saying, oh, look, our, our, our water supply, the pipes are all falling apart. It's all this old infrastructure. I'm just struggling to see how are they actually going to pay to to revitalize this infrastructure without bringing in some sort of, you know, I mean, to, to me, the, the obvious way to do it is to privatize it, bring in some, you know, third party who can come in, fix up all the pipes, you know, maybe they'll do a little bit of gold plating, but hopefully not, you know, they should have an incentive to be rational about it. But it means that the people's water bills are going to go up because they've got new infrastructure to pay for, which they haven't been paying for for the last 50 years or whatever. And that's why it's fallen apart to begin with. So, so essentially, people have become accustomed to this low user fees, but it's because they haven't been capitalizing in the cost of maintenance of, of all this stuff or, or the cost of you know, replacing it when needed. Right. Utilities are a special issue because utility is a monopoly by definition, right? Like you're not getting water from two different competing sources who can compete on price. You know, you got one water pipe to your house and it's run by a utility. What you see a lot of times is that cities will defer all this maintenance. They'll get themselves into a horrible jam and they'll say, well, to get ourselves out of this, we're going to privatize our system. Mm. And privatizing the system does two or three things right away. The first thing it does is often when you privatize, whatever company gets it will actually buy it from you. They actually give you some money for it. Yeah, It's not that much money because there's more liability there. They're, they're really paying a, a weird kind of toll because now they get to have a monopoly power uh, is what they're paying you for. And for a lot of cities that will close like a budget gap, you know, so let's privatize this and we'll close our budget gap this year, which is really like a dumb transaction. The private utility of them will come in and they'll do two things. First, they'll make the labor part of the equation a lot more efficient. So they'll lay off people, they'll streamline it, they'll cut out middle management, they'll do things that private businesses do to make themselves run more efficiently. And there might be some outcry in the community, but people can usually live with that. The other thing they do, though, that really makes everyone angry is they say, here's actually the cost of maintaining this thing. Yeah. And your water rates are going to go up two times, three times, four times. And yes, you know, our profit margins are 4%, 5%, 6%. But you know, here's how we're coming up with that. If you're running this as a government, your profit margin should be 4 5 6% <laughs> because you have to be putting money away too. So what happens is that there becomes a lot of outrage over privatization when really what the privatization tends to do is merely run the system the way that a competently run system should be. And the local governments generally don't have the incentive to make those hard decisions. Yeah, it, it seems to me that there's a lot of this sort of historical subsidization of these, of these utilities and stuff. Privatization is really just a way to almost to force the actual use costs onto the users, which, yeah, like you said, it, it can be painful if people have become accustomed to this, this sort of subsidized existence of it. I don't know. Tim, did you have something else you wanted to, to jump in with there? No, I just, um, we, we um, just recorded another episode we're going to put out where one, one topic we talked about was this idea that we call privatization versus privateering. And what we see is Amen. that, yeah. is <laughs> that there is, again, a problem we've gotten ourselves into where we have these monopoly systems, these monopoly infrastructure systems, whether it's utilities, whether it's a, a road network in a given area that have been developed as the only option in town, let's say. And so now when you go to try to divest that from government, you know, the only option is to is to make it now a private monopoly, which of course has all the problems you you just described. Um, exactly. I feel like I the guess, most insidious part of that though, it, and this is the private it, they've 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 branded this private public partnership, mm. which to me is like, let's get Wall Street, you know, pirateers in to uh to the, the worst one, and I think the personification of this to me is uh, the Arizona State Capitol. I don't know if you guys heard of this one or remember this one, but the state of Arizona had a budget gap one year, like a big budget gap. 
And so part of closing that budget gap was they sold their state capital building, like the, the actual building where the legislators meet. They sold that to a private company. And then they signed like a 30-year lease or a 40-year, 50-year lease <laughs> to make lease payments to use the building. So they basically like hawked the family silver <laughs> yeah. and then rented it back, you know? So they still like pretended they had the silver, but they got this one-time payment that allowed them to close the budget gap. I see cities when they start down this private partnership kind of game, really doing the same thing. And cities, I'm not saying cities are dumb because cities have, you know, city governments have some very sophisticated people and many of them running things. But the incentives are way different, way, way different. And I think that we should be really leery of these deals, not because you know, the private sector is bad, but because when you're dealing with these monopoly situations, especially when you're dealing with desperate finances for local governments, there's not a lot of good decision-making being made, you know, decisions that, that are good for the public. I guess I'm wondering, Chuck, in, in all your experience, have you, have you seen some examples out there of governments divesting some part of, of their responsibilities, whether it's municipal, some municipal service like trash collection or certain properties like certain pieces of infrastructure or roads. Uh, I mean, ha have you seen some examples out there where that's been done successfully or where it's been done? Well, yeah, we'll call it successfully. <laughs> yeah, no, d definitely. I, I think the best example is the city of Memphis. For many years, the city of Memphis was probably the worst example of, you know, a certain kind of mismanagement. So every year they would get to the end, and this went on for a couple of decades at, that I know of, at least, maybe more. They would get to the end of the year and they'd have their budget they were going through and they would wind up with a, a gap in their budget that they couldn't fill. And so what they would do is they would go out and they would say, we're going to annex these 50 acres out on the edge of town. And what that would do is that would bring in immediate revenue that you could book onto the books for the, the upcoming year. So it solved your budget problem for the next fiscal year. But the expenses involved in providing the service and the maintenance and the new utilities and all the things that would have to happen with this new and next land, that would go on a subsequent year. And so what it did is it gave you this influx of revenue that solved your immediate cash problem. The next year, then you get to the end and now you've got to have these expenses on your budget for the next year and you've got this big gap. So what do you do? You go in next, another 60 acres. <laughs> um, Memphis is, and, and I, I can't say this precisely because I don't know the numbers, but you know how like Detroit, the, the narrative of Detroit is like, there's too much stuff and not enough people. Memphis is something like twice the size land area of Detroit and two thirds of the people. So, you know, whatever gap you think you have in Detroit, like Memphis is way worse. And it's because every year they just continue to grow horizontally and gobble up more property as a way to solve their current budget problem. Memphis is now in the process. Me Memphis came to grips with this a while back. I was on stage with the mayor at the time, AC Wharton, when he made an announcement, we are no longer going to annex property. Like that is done. And now they've actually, under a new mayor and a new administration, they're taking that one step further and they're actually de-annexing property. So they're actually shrinking the size of the city. They're going to neighborhoods that were annexed and saying, look, we can provide you the services, but here's what it's going to cost. If you don't want that, we are willing to essentially back out of this deal. We'll do a little cash payment to the, I think the township gets a little bit of cash. There's like an exchange to basically divest themselves, but they're making what amounts to a really kind of smart financial decision by voluntarily and purposefully shrinking the size of their city in a way that causes them some near-term financial pain, but long-term really does a lot to fix their balance sheet. Hmm. That's interesting. So what happens when they, when they, there's an area that they say, you're free, go out, <laughs> go forth and prosper, but we're not, we're not, you know, <laughs> we're not paying well, in, your, uh, in that sense, in, in that, well, in how, that how, how did you react to that? I mean, how well, do the in, people in, are in those areas? Yeah, it's it's my understanding, and I have not been on the ground in any of these hearings or anything, but it's it's my understanding from speaking to people there that the people being DNX'd want to be DNX'd. Like they okay. they are looking at it as we're gonna have lower taxes, 
We're yeah. going to have less government. You know, we're not getting the services anyway. So let's DNX. And essentially what would happen is that they revert to, in this case, either the county or like a township government, a less intense level of government they would mm -hmm. uh, revert back to. And, you know, I've seen de-annexations here in Minnesota where they go back to either being unorganized, where they're, you know, essentially governed by the county, the county sheriff, that kind of thing, or they go to a township. And that's a, it's a very like common, acceptable thing to do. We talked a little bit earlier about trying to get use fee or, or, or usage costs more aligned with, um, with, with the actual use of, of services. When everything's done through this sort of government, you know, local government model, where essentially you've got people paying taxes, and then that money is allocated to, to providing the services. I know that strong towns, you guys quite often will use sort of tax revenue as like probably a, a bit of a proxy for the, the success of a local strategy or whatever, you know, for how productive is, is a certain neighborhood. Right. But, you know, obviously libertarians, we don't like taxes. We'd like to see other, other sort of revenue models, I guess, for providing those services. And one thing that, that strikes me is when you're relying on something like property taxes or sales taxes or whatever, there's sort of an inherently a disconnect between the revenue that you're taking in and the services that you're providing. I mean, there, I, I suppose there's some sort of proxies you could give with property values and stuff like that for certain services. But I'd probably like to see more of a direct use fee for a lot of this stuff. And I guess the way I see it is that what we think of as, as the local government, from a sort of ultra-libertarian perspective, you could almost look at that as more of like a buyer's group, where you do have this sort of collective or communal organization you know, that does have a bit of bargaining power and all this. But rather than saying, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to, tax you on some basis, and then we're going to spend that money to provide services to you somehow. I'd like to see it more directly aligned to say, okay, well, we'll manage this whole trans, you know, you talked a bit earlier about the transaction cost. So you've got some sort of group there, you know, you can call it a government if you want, but it's not actually charging taxes. Instead, what it's doing is basically negotiating with service providers on behalf of the, the citizens. There's this really interesting alignment that happens when you get down to the very local level. And I think people who advocate for the disadvantaged and the impoverished at the local level have a real alignment here with libertarians, people who say people should be paying for the services that they want. Let me give you an example of this. And I'll go back to Lafayette, Louisiana again. One of the most financially productive neighborhoods in Lafayette is also the poorest. These are neighborhoods where when we study this and, and ran the math, people were paying way more in taxes than they were requiring in services, assuming that they were going to get the service. They were actually not getting their streets properly maintained and their sidewalks maintained. But even if the city had been doing that, they still would have been cash flow positive in these neighborhoods. When you went out to the edge of town and you look at some of these big lots, some of these huge properties, very expensive properties, what we found there is the exact opposite. Even though individually these people were paying a lot of taxes, uh, the cost of service there was so much higher that the city, the community was losing a lot of money on them. Now, let me give you a way to think about this. If you went to the poor neighborhood, a lot of those were older lots and they were built at a time when we were a poor country. If you are poor people building poor lots in a swamp in Louisiana, and you know, you're all going to have to pay communally to maintain this pipe in front of you, what do you do? You make your lot narrow and you make it deep. And so what you see is that the houses are skinny and they're really deep. You know, you might have 20, 25 foot lots along a block. Okay, go out to the edge of town. Now that we have the ability to finance things on the secondary market, pump a whole bunch of cash in, take on a bunch of debt, grow, 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 a lot of frontage per lot. And so you might have a 200 foot lot out there with a million dollar home on it. But in the core neighborhoods, you've got eight lots in the same 200 feet. And if you look at that, that's eight water bills being paid as opposed to one. It's eight sewer bills being paid as opposed to one in the same amount of, of footage. And sure, that one might pay a lot of taxes, but they're not paying eight times the taxes of the ones in the core neighborhoods. And so all of a sudden, you see that the rote efficiency of traditional incremental development patterns generates a kind of approach where there's a lot of revenue raised in a very small area. 
if people paid what their actual costs were, what you would see is that each of those lots in the poor neighborhoods, their taxes would probably go down. But even if they stayed the same, what would happen on the far edge is that the tax would go up 20 times. I mean, it, it, the, the user fees would go way, way up, way up. And so what you have in a sense, and this is why I think there's this alignment between, you know, across the political spectrum on some of these issues, what you have is the poorest neighborhoods in the community actually subsidizing the wealthiest neighborhoods in the community. While everybody kind of believes that it's the exact opposite, that, you know, the wealthy person is paying way more because their tax bill is higher but their actual service cost is bizarrely higher. Right. And that's, that's ultimately the killer. Can we, I just want to understand, you mentioned this ratio of, I guess, tax payments to, to the, the, the service costs. What do you look at for metrics for, let's say the productivity of, of a certain area? Is it, are you looking at property values? Are you looking at property tax receipts? Are you looking at something like GDP and you know, economic productivity, job creation? How do you quantify a productive area? Here's what I kind of stumbled into early on. There's a guy named Joe Minicozzi who does a lot of this economic modeling. He's become a, a really close friend of mine. We've done a lot of work together. All that work in Lafayette was Joe's firm with me kind of tagging along, providing some advice and feedback along the way. What we found is that wealth creation is really the proxy for success. When we look at, and the, the kind of rough model is value per acre, how much is the property worth per acre? What kind of wealth are you generating per acre of ground that you're consuming? When we look at that metric, what we have found time and time again is that it correlates with success in almost every way. So if you want to look at economic growth, if you want to look at overall profit margin, if you want to look at return on investment, these are all really intricate, deep analyses that take a lot of time and a lot of effort. If you just look at value per acre, which is like a third grade math, I mean, it's literally like division. How much is this property worth and how big of it is it in terms of acres? If you look at that, it is an almost perfect proxy for all these other things you want to look at. This holds true in cities where there's high sales tax. This holds true in cities where they use a property tax. This holds true in cities where there's a, an income tax. And so what we found is that basically, if you are a community generating wealth, where that wealth exceeds your overall costs of carrying, where you in a sense have good, high financial productivity and value per acre, the math is going to work on everything else you want to do. And I'll give you an example of how to think about this. If you think of like the Empire State Building, there's no scenario in which the Empire State Building goes bad because the city is unable to provide street maintenance and maintenance of the pipe and basic police protection and fire protection. There's, there's no scenario because the Empire State Building is this massive multi-billion dollar building on this small footprint. If you go to some of the projects I worked on in the 90s as an engineer, where you would have a little trailer house on a one and a half acre lot with $90,000 of public utilities to it, there's no way that you can extract enough wealth from that trailer house to pay to sustain those utilities over its life cycle. And so it's not a perfect, like I'm not saying that everywhere you have high financial productivity, it works. But as a general rule, what we look at is value per acre. And that correlates really well to success. Here's kind of the crazy thing. Joe and I were at Harvard. He uh, went to grad school at Harvard and I was there giving a lecture. And we went over to the, uh, the School of Design and we were in the basement going through these old planning books from the 1800s. And when you'd open them up and they talk about, you know, here's our town planning manual. And it, it, it would go through, here's, you know, here's how you plan a town. And it was basically like their textbook of the time. Over and over and over again, here's the metric they used, value per acre, value per acre, value per acre, value per acre. We lost that because we started to think of it in terms of growth. Like how many new units can you have? How much can you grow your tax base? And we forgot about the cost because the costs were immaterial to us. They were out in the future. We didn't care about them. Back when they were real, when they actually had to deal with them as a real present thing, they obsessed about value per acre. And to me, that was like the final endorsement that said, yeah, this is, this is the metric we should be thinking of these things in. So then I guess, I mean, when I think about value per acre and, and thinking about the way that a city develops, um, typically there's a correlation there with, with density. 
I mean, is it is it an oversimplification to say that dense places tend to be stronger places or more resilient places? My reflexive answer to that is yes, it's an oversimplification. And I say that as a planner who has seen like the worst bastardization of the density metric uh, <laughs> possible. Planners love simple metrics because if you can say, you know, success correlates with density, a planner can go out and build you the most dense thing you can imagine. And they'll call it success. And it will be a financial apocalypse. I mean, it will just be like atrocious. Uh, it will last two decades. Everyone will move out. Everyone will hate it. It won't work. Urban renewal is a basically poster child for people who thought density was the answer, right? And it's, you know, just long line of failures. What we talk about at Strong Downs is, is not density, but a correlation between public investment and private investment. Now, that correlates really well to density over time, but it's not caused by density. Density is like a, a side effect of it. And let me give a little depth to that. If you look at the farm that I grew up on, I grew up on a farm in rural Minnesota. It was homesteaded by my great-great-grandparents about three miles from where I'm sitting right now. When I grew up, that farm sat on a basically two-tire path trail through the woods. That was the public road. It was, you know, two tire tracks and, uh, you know, there's no sewer, no water, no paved street, nothing. My parents didn't pay a lot in tax. I think in like a year they'd pay like 300 bucks. Like it was nothing, but they also, when it snowed, it took them two days to plow us out. You know, <laughs> if we would have called the police, it would have taken them half an hour to get there. If our barn caught on fire, no fire truck was ever going to get there before the barn burned down. Like that was just part of the deal. So you look at that farm and from a financial productivity standpoint, really, really productive. It didn't require a lot of services. It didn't require a lot of cost. It didn't pay a lot in taxes, but it balanced out really well. If you go now into the core downtown and the core neighborhoods where you see a lot of service demand, you also get a lot more density now. You get a lot more stuff going on and the ratio between public investment and the private investment changes. There's sewer in the street, there's water in the street, there's paved streets, but there's also a lot more wealth in those neighborhoods. It's that stuff in the middle where we really struggle, where you've got like lots of public investment and the private investment is really low. And kind of the poster child for this is a big box store. When I was doing strictly engineering work, I work with a number of, of big box stores. I remember when the Home Depot came in, and we did the site work for them. So all the underground utilities and, and the, the streets and the roads that rung the store, those are a couple million dollars. They came in and within like two weeks built the building. It was just all a bunch of reinforced concrete panels that were thrown up. It was the cheapest building you can imagine. The value of that building is in like the copper wiring and the light fixtures and the, <laughs> the you know, that stuff. They were building that thing for like $35, $40 a square foot. It was nothing. Yeah. 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 And so you, you have basically a lot of public and you have millions of public investment and the public investment was almost as much as the private investment. And certainly once that building goes dark and Home Depot moves on or what has you, you know, you're going to have way more public investment in raw dollar terms than you have private. What we've looked at is you need to be viable. You need to have about a 20 to one at a minimum between 20 to one and 40 to one ratio of private wealth to public obligation. So if you're going to have a million dollars of pipe in the ground, you got to have $40 million of wealth to sustain that over time. When you look at like a big box store, you're looking at something that's one to one or in some ways less than one to one. And so it's that ratio is completely upside down. That's the way I would look at it instead of density. Cause I think density will get you to places you don't want to go. I think we're coming up on time here. You've got a kind of a hard stop. I do. Let me ask you guys a question. Sure. Because I was thinking about this today, because this is one that I've struggled with. And I don't really know the answer for this, but let me give you the scenario. A uh, small town has a, let's just use a movie theater as an example, because that's one I'm familiar with. Small town has someone who wants to come in and build a movie theater, wants to open up. They're not asking for any subsidies. They're not asking for any tax breaks. They're willing to pay their own freight. The problem is they know in the market that if they go in and they invest, this is like a ma and pa, you know, we're going to put in two screens or whatever, and we're going to show, you know, what, what's going on, but we're going to put our money, our labor, our effort into this. We know that if we open up, 
And a year later, AMC comes in on the outskirts of town and opens up the six plex or the 12 plex that we're going to go out of business overnight. This is going to be over. So what we're going to ask you, the city is, will you protect us from that? Will you in a sense zone the property so that we can be competitive here? We're not looking for, I mean, we're looking for a monopoly, but we're not looking to gouge prices. We're not going to charge 20 bucks to go to a movie. We still have to be competitive because we're competing against other entertainment options in town. But if the choice is between no movie theater in this town or a movie theater with some modest monopoly protection or protection from competition in a small town, where do we fall? And I've struggled with this one because I understand the economics of this person who wants to step up and do this. And I also would like a movie theater in my town. And I also understand that like, I'd like to support the local family instead of the AMC. Where do you think a libertarian, a true libertarian or, or would fall on something like this? Yeah, I think, I mean, my, my knee jerk libertarian reaction is to say, well, look, it's you don't get any special privileges, even if it's, if, you know, aesthetically a better choice for the community or whatever. I mean, I guess realistically in, in a situation like that, once they've got the one small movie theater built in the town, then, you know, AMC is going to come in, look at it, say, well, look, they've already got a movie theater here. There's only 14,000 people in the town. Is it, is it really viable for us to build this thing? They might say, well, they got the two seater now. They got a two screen proof of concept. So now <laughs> yeah, I can come yeah, in with my right. six and, yeah. and I got, you know, I got Wall Street capital that's yeah. looking for a place to go. I can get low financing. I got people who, you know, they, they just prove the concept. I just got to drive them out of business and then I own the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's another sort of bias there where the way it would happen these days is, is yeah, AMC probably would come in because they're going to get all these other subsidies of the, the strode running out to their theater exactly, and the, the utilities coming out to their theater and everything. And it is tricky because, you know, personally, yeah, I would prefer the little small local thing. And I don't know, I, I think the libertarian instinct is to, to say, well, look, it doesn't really matter what you want. You know, you, you can't point a gun at someone and, and force them to do something, whether that's through zoning or, you know, tax incentives or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But, but to add on, sorry, Joe, to, to add on to what you just said, you know, we're already in a situation where there's all kinds of subsidy out there for the big box, as you just said, Chuck, for this big box model of development. And not just that, but all kinds of corporate types of, of investment, as you said, the, the cheap financing that, that trickles down from the Federal Reserve policy and all that kind of stuff. There is there's so much, I mean, people think, oh, when we talk about the free market, that we're talking about something that actually exists out there. And it's like, no, right. there, is, there is so much manipulation of the economy at, at every single level from the top down through Wall Street to these large corporations, into our cities with all this infrastructure and stuff that gets spread out and spreads all this development out that makes these business models like the Home Depots and the, and the Sixplex AMC theater, that makes them viable. And so I guess our first instinct would be to say, you know, first, you know, harm. First, to take all that stuff off the table right? so that we have some kind of level playing field to talk about. So in the example you gave, it's really the idea that you're going to have some kind of government enforced protection for this one particular small business model. It's a band-aid to a, a much bigger problem, which was already created by government policy um, in a large part. I mean, there are obviously other things at play here, but. I've struggled so. with this one because I, I don't, I think like you guys, like, I don't know if there's a clear answer. Yeah. Um, my conservative instincts have kind of come out in this one. And I'll tell you, I've decided that I would recommend the city go ahead and do that, you know, basically change their ordinance to not allow another theater. And here's why, you know, all the reasons you talked about economically, but on the other side, the city can always change it back. And I think the thing that kind of crops up in a community is that if the people who own the theater all of a sudden became total jerks, <laughs> like, you know, started charging a lot or excess amount or, you know, flaunted their monopoly power in some way, or just, you know, from a social pressure standpoint, uh, we're not very socially nice to the people in the community. I think there would naturally over time be kind of a pushback where you'd say, okay, what the community giveth, the community can taketh away. <laughs> we do have the opportunity to change the zoning back and uh, you've not been a very good partner. So we're going to do that. It's interesting because I think it drives a certain level of 
community cooperation. It gets a little bit back to de Tocqueville, you know, like we have these civic organizations and we all kind of have to work together. And, you know, the hedge on CEO pay excess is not a federal law, but is the fact that the CEO has to actually see and interact and live down the block with the person who cleans the bathroom at the company. And that tends to be a hedge on excess because we're all human. And I guess that's kind of where I've fallen is that the more things can be localized in a sense, the more our, if we want to just say better angels or better instincts tend to govern those things as opposed to needing some like centralized force to enforce some you know fairness upon the situation. Yeah, I, w- I would agree with that. And I think, or at least I hope that a, a more libertarian society would be a more local society, more community-based society that would support the mom and pop movie theater over the big box. I guess my, just to, to kind of close off that thought, my concern is that if we're going to give government the power to pick winners and losers, to say, well, we like this type of movie theater better than that type of movie theater, that's going to work out in some cases. And in a lot of cases, it's not going to. There's going to be a lot of cases where they're picking the sixplex over the I'm over nodding the my head. Because, yeah. because there are a lot of, <laughs> as you said, the whole the, the growth Ponzi scheme, there are a lot of immediate advantages to the town and taking on this big corporate whatever into the town rather than giving that same privilege, whatever it may be, to the local movie series. So I worry that once you open that door, once you give them that power, that it's not going to go the way you think it will. (laughs) Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. And this is why I think the local ability to adapt and change is so important. When these things become embedded in state laws and federal laws, they build up these constituencies that are out of touch from us. And and that's kind of been my biggest pushback with those initiatives. It's not that I think they're bad or not dealing with a real market failure, but like you say, let's do no harm first. And then let's see what we can fix ourselves. And uh, I think a lot of those things we can. Yeah. And I'll say to add on, I mean, to add on to that, I would say we should also trust the community that if there is this business going in that we think the community is going to love and that that is going to enforce that community by you know building up the downtown area, let's say, by creating this a business owner who's involved with the community, that to some extent, I think we should trust the community to support that business and to value that above the experience of driving to a big movie theater, that which is an experience you could have anywhere. We should hope that people would value that local experience that their local movie theater might give them compared to the the big box experience. And I mean that literally and figuratively yeah. <laughs> of, yeah. the, of the big movie theater. Um, and in that case, if you do have a community that's supporting this business, then obviously there's, there's no need for the government to be supporting them. Right. So Chuck, I know that you have recently announced that you have been working on a book, which is a, a big project for you and a big step, I think, for Strong Towns. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Strong Towns, you know, start as a blog and uh my my hope was to someday write a book. We've published a, a few books that are collections of the essays we've written on the blog, but I, I hadn't really been to the point where I was ready to write a book. And now this last fall I was approached by Wiley and Sons, one of the major publishers in in the US, and we worked out a deal and and I started on it and in 6 months put together 70,000 words in a book that's called Strong Towns, A Bottom-Up Revolution to Rebuild American Prosperity. And it comes out October 1st. I'm really excited. We submitted it. uh, I submitted it to the publisher early this month. And they got back to me last week and said, we might have some minor copy edits, but we like this. Like, there's not going to be any changes. This is a good book. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Which is a, I felt like was a huge I mean, this is what they do. So the fact that they uh, signed off on it that quickly and, you know, it's a, it's the strong town story, you know, it's, it's cities as complex dynamic systems with the implications of that are how our incentives are misaligned at the local level, how our macro economy has forced cities to become very fragile how we opt out of that system and start to do things differently at the local level, how we retool our local government, our local investment strategy to make our cities strong and productive and more prosperous places to live, and how that can be a platform for us to live better lives. I'm psyched about this book. It comes out October 1st. We're doing a book tour. We announced the book tour and asked people, you know, if you want us to come to your place, let us know. 
we were thinking we'd get 25, 30 responses. Uh, we're up over 190 some now. <laughs> uh, so we, we planned uh, nine weeks at the end of the year. We're now extending that into 2020. So I can promise you, you know, not necessarily Australia. I would love to make it there, <laughs> Joe. But uh, um, if you're in North America, our plan is to get somewhere within travel distance of you. Uh, if not in 2019, then in the first half of 2020 because we want to share this message with, with every community across the country. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. That's excellent. Really looking forward to it. Yeah. And, and even just, as you said, Strong Town started out as a blog and I mean, it really has become a movement, which is pretty amazing. I mean, we've been doing this podcast for a couple of years, you know, we, we struggle to get out six episodes a year. <laughs> of course, you know, being, <laughs> being in Australia here, it's a, uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a logistics challenge, but I hear you. It's amazing to see all, all the, uh, the content that you've produced on, on strong towns, as well as, you know, I, I know that you're constantly traveling around the U S visiting all these different towns, meeting with people and, I guess, uh, scaring them straight <laughs> to some extent yeah. as, as, as to the situations that their, that their towns are in and, um, and offering up some solutions. Yeah. I did over 60 nights on the road last year wow. and, and mm. so, gave something like a hundred presentations. It's amazing because, you know, back when I started, it was literally me writing a blog as opposed to going to a therapist, you know, I, I had worked in, <laughs> and I joke about that, but it's actually true. I, I work in planning and engineering for a long time. And when we hit the housing crisis, I had been screaming as loud as I could in the cities that I worked that like, this is not going well. Yeah. And I didn't really predict the housing aspect of it, but I did predict like the city doom part of it. You know, we were building subdivisions that made no sense at all from the city standpoint. I mean, things that if they had worked out perfectly, were going to be financial disasters and the cities couldn't approve them fast enough. And they would hire me to come in and walk them through the process. And as I'm going through the process, I'm like, you know, this makes no sense, right? And they're like, yeah, we don't care. Just approve it. Um, at one point in my county, we had, uh, based on the peak year of issuing permits, we had over 100 years of vacant developed lots. So, you know, you guys are supply demand people. When you have 100 years of supply, uh, you know, what's the price? Zero. <laughs> yeah. Zero. But they were still charging a premium and building more lots. So, by the time we got to 2008, I was just, I thought either I'm crazy or the world's crazy. <laughs> and I was open to either possibility. <laughs> so I started to write and then uh, some friends of mine encouraged me and, and actually started the nonprofit. They filled out the paperwork and got it going. And then I had a foundation here in Minnesota, give me a grant and tell me, like, we want you to go out and share this message with as many places as you can. And in those early days, I would write three days a week and I would travel around and, and just give talks. You know, I, I drove six hours to Bismarck once and two people showed up. <laughs> it was very frequently that I'd go somewhere and I'd give this talk and, you know, two, three people would be there. But, you know, it gave me a chance to kind of refine the message and, and figure out how to communicate these really complex issues. I kept writing uh, pretty soon. Yeah. You know, we're now at the point where we've got people who write every day for us. I write once or twice a week, but we're putting out two, three articles a day. We've got three different podcast streams, the Strong Towns podcast. We also do this UpZoned and then It's the Little Things. We have three different podcasts going. We're up to almost 3,000 members in this movement. So people who give us money every month to support us sharing this message. And then, yeah, I mean, I'm on the road a lot. Uh, we're going to have a couple million different people read our content and share our content this year. And those numbers astound. I mean, there's a, there's a hunger and an energy for this. And it's very real. And it's also very humbling for me as someone who remembers those days when like, I was literally like, I need to go see a therapist because the world mm -hmm. seems crazy. And all these people are standing up saying, yeah, it seems crazy to us too. Let's figure this out. Yeah, it's really great. I guess if, if some of our listeners want to start getting into the Strong Towns, where's the best place for them to start in terms of, is, is there sort of a 101 series that they can get into on your site? Yeah. If you go to strongtowns.org, there is a link on the homepage for newcomers. Okay. The interesting thing is that Strong Towns, we center on this financial resiliency, but we talk about it as there's a lot of doors into our conversation. We're doing a series now where we're distributing this stuff we wrote on the land tax. 
So we have a lot of like tax policy geeks that are all of a sudden discovering strong towns and, and loving this stuff. Mm. But we've got pedestrian advocates, transportation people, engineers, planners, people who do a retail and are interested in downtowns and main streets. We've got environmental people who are fascinated and, and, and get involved in our movement. Uh, we've got people who are interested in reforming local government, reforming state and federal government. So there's a lot of different avenues into our conversation. If you go to strongtowns.org, scroll down a little bit, there's a newcomers page. You'll find like a gateway there that will work for you most likely. If not, just hang out. I mean, you're going to get a content piece within a couple of days. I mean, you can scroll back and see what we got. You're going to find something that interests you and, and be able to delve in and get involved that way. We also have on our site, there's a connect button on the homepage right at the top in the menu. Uh, we've got something like 90 different local groups that have just spontaneously started around the country. We, we don't direct them, but we do put them on a map and let people find them because people want to talk about strong towns and their communities and how it applies to them. And so we created this page and there's all these groups that meet some weekly, some monthly to talk about how do we put these things to work in our place? So if you're hungry for the conversation on a local level, there's also that. And then we've got these books that we put out that are kind of like the collection of our best pieces. So if you're looking for like a quick get up to speed, those are available wherever you get books. They're called Thoughts on Building Strong Towns. There's a few volumes. But the, uh, the big book coming out in, in October is kind of going to be like the signature narrative that kind of puts it all together. And that's the one where, you know, you can pre-order it right now and it will show up on your door on October 1st is what I've been told, if not earlier. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chuck, for taking the time with us today and, and going through your message. I think it's something that, that our listeners will really uh, respond well to and hopefully they'll go and, and check out your website and buy the book and look into everything you guys are doing. Thank you. I appreciate the conversation. It's been very fun. <laughs> Thanks. Same here. Thanks, Chuck. You guys take care. Thanks for listening to An Architecture Podcast, the built environment of a stateless society. Visit anarchitecturepodcast.com to follow our blog and social media and find out how you can support us through Patreon or with cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency.